the summer of 1977, I think it was something like 25, 26 of us left the cage. Not really voluntarily, like we left in protest at the way um, the present staff, the NLA staff in the cage was conducting its business. Um, so the screws kept us in the, um, what was known as the boards area for about maybe six weeks, two months. Can't remember exactly when, like, or exactly how long. And they made a decision to take the political status off us. They moved us down to the haste blocks. And the difference between the cages and the haste blocks was the difference night and day. And um, when I recall my first. My first memory like, of going into the H-blocks was going into the circle, it was H5. It was a blanket protest was going on, we joined the, the blanket protest. And, and my first sort of experience was getting a big punch in the head, and a few kicks going down the wing, and being told I was no longer in the cages, and being called a Fenian bastard and a scumbag and stuff like that. So that was my introduction to the H-blocks. But, um, I can't remember how long we stayed on the blanket that period. It was a very short period, so it was because um, our sort of position was, was unique, I think, in the prison at that time. We were actually in a catch-22 position because we were special category prisoners who had lost their status, but we had nowhere to go. And I can remember the, the governor coming around the cells of all the NLA prisoners who had walked out of the cage at that time and asked us what, what we were doing on the blanket protest. And we said, well, political status, blah, blah, blah. And the governor said, well, no problem, I'll arrange a van here and you can go back to the cages, which we couldn't do. So there was a decision made among the lot of us, like, hey, what are we doing here? Like, um, so we went down to the working blocks and that was 1977, it came in August, September. So that was my introduction to the hitch blocks. So since we, we left the cages, 1977, sometime around the summer, we were held in um, solitary confinement for maybe six weeks, eight weeks, in what was known as the boards area. And we were told our political status had been taken off us, and we were brought to the H blocks. I can remember the first H block we came to was H5. It was a, the blanket protest was going on at that stage. I can remember walking in there, and we were lined up along this girl here, like I can't remember how many of us there were because we were all split up. It was four or five of us, six of us, going to protect our wing. I can't mind standing there, like I don't know many screws in the circle area here, like quite a number, like 20 maybe. And I could get a sort of lot of verbal abuse. And I can remember getting punched through them grills there and punched down the cell. the end of summer 77 until the summer of 78 I've been consistently getting beatings from the screws. The degree of the beatings would have varied, you know, sometimes there would have been a couple of slaps around the head which was really nothing like, a couple of kicks and some would have been quite serious kickings, beatings. And I can remember, I think it was the last week in June, maybe the first week in July of 1978, been moved to, from one block to another block. I can't remember which ones like, but I can remember going down D wing and um, being brought into it was the first cell, um, which would have been known as a, like it was the screws cell really like, um, and being told that 
I would have to call the screws, sir, whenever I addressed them, which I refused to do. And I got a serious hiding and I was knocked unconscious. And I can remember they must have dragged me down to the cell. I can't remember that, like, but I do remember waking up in the cell itself. And I was brought in again and went through the same procedure. Five screws were involved, like I came out, two of them hold me by the arms, like I say here. And there was two facing me and one behind me. And basically, they just, they just got onto me, like, uh, big boots. And I came out getting a, a kick between the legs. I came out, how they got there, I came out, going down the gut. And then I came out just seeing, like, a big flash. I got a kick in the back, somewhere around the back of the ear, like, I was knocked unconscious again. And then they brought me down to the cell again, I woke up in the cell again, and I can remember the flap being opened. This is all over a period of maybe two hours. I can remember a flap being opened, like, and a screw shouting down, he's okay. And about five minutes later, like, they came in and they gave me a pattern in the cell again, like, and it was quite a vicious kick in, so it was. And I think practically half an hour after that there, um, they got the van and I was brought to the hospital. And I was kept in the hospital for something like, I can't really remember how long, like it was something like five, six, seven days, like suffering from concussion, a lot of bruising. And I can remember while in the hospital, the doctor being very angry with the screws, demanding they know what happened to me. And I refused to talk to both the governor, to the doctor, and anybody else what happened to me. Because I already had an experience about a number of years prior to that, when I got a kick in Crumman Road Jail. As a 17 year old, like, fairly nasty kicking as well, so it was. And I can remember making a complaint because of sort of black eyes, uh, bruising all in my body. And I made a complaint about the screws attacking me and B Wing, Crumman Road Jail, on the boards. And they took the details, blah, blah, blah. And I think it was maybe two weeks later, I was sentenced to something like 14 days solitary confinement. Sometimes I come out actually here fighting with maybe four or five screws, I was completely naked. And I come out being trailed up in between them grills there. I come out being, they were at me with brushes. I come out being pinned against the wall. Like, I was completely naked, like, I have been 19, 20 years of age then. Like, I come out completely put up against the wall with all sorts of brushes and maps, and they were kicking the shit just basically out of me. Like. And I fought back, so I did. And I knew I was on a loser. So and I, can, I can remember also, like in, in this particular block, they used a cell here for all the uniforms would be on it. Like, and you know, when we were going visits, they brought you here. You took a, you took your blanket off. You came up in the towel. You came in here. You put the uniform on to go to visit. And on the way back again, they brought you in as well. And what they had was like a big sponge foam with a mirror on it, and it actually, you know, they, you'd be completely naked. You'd be standing on the top of it, like, and it actually squat. You refuse to do it. A couple of screws would kick your legs again, you go down, and they'd put you down again, and I just fought back. And uh, I'd get a hiding for it, like, and sometimes just taking the boards, and you've been given three days solitary confinement, 28 days loss of remission. I've been here during the, the first hunger strike, and 
the hidings from the screws, you know, it wasn't just me, it was everybody, everybody got on it. And sometimes you were just waiting, and sometimes the waiting was the worst. You know, you'd, you'd heard the kickings maybe starting from that cell there, like going to each cell, give everybody a bit of a duffing, like. And I think the waiting was the worst, like, and then once you got it, like, you were happy, oh, fuck it, you know. Took, took your oil, basically, type thing, like. But the real bad hiding I got, like, which I was uh, talked about earlier on, like, in 1978, that's forced. I felt at that time like it w the bins were never going to end. They were consistent, like, and they were getting heavier and heavier. And what you had was like grown men then, like, and I was just turned 20 years of age. And they'd been holding you down the ground, like, and they were wearing these work boots and big kicks in the head, back. And this had to be coming from the very top. I had to come from the Northern Ireland office, give them hell, batter, batter the shit, clean it up, like, because they don't consistently. Like, they broke prisoners' arms. They give the you know, prisoners constantly going to the hospital. Uh, with quite serious injuries, so there was no doubt in my mind, like, this was coming from the very top. When I came back from the present hospital after the hiding that time, I recovered from injuries, I immediately went, you know, the governor had told me that it wasn't going to end, that it was going to get more beatings. Now, this has come from the governor. <laughs> so I made a decision to go on hunger strike because I felt that they were going to kick me to death. And I said, well, I'm a, if I'm going to die, like, I'll, I'll go this way here like, and protest. So I went on hunger strike. And, um, it was 20 years of age at the time. I can remember the governor bring me out. And uh, I'll not name him because like, I don't think I can name names here. Like. But he was a scumbag, so he was like. Uh, but what he said to me was that he hopes I'm on it from now to Christmas, and this was July. And he was saying, like, he was. They actually. Uh, their attitude actually made me more determined to stay on it. And I hadn't a clue about anything about hunger strikes, how long it would last. I thought around maybe 30, 40 days I'd be dead. Like. So anyway. Uh, I could maybe be at the present hospital, maybe after something like two weeks while I was in hunger strike. And they've done tests every day to make sure you're not eating and stuff like that. You know, they've done urine tests, blood tests, and time went on and time went on. Like, and um, I lost a lot of weight. And I ended the hunger strike on the 50th day after a number of American congressmen had intervened in the case. Now, initially, I went on the hunger strike. Because of the beatings I was getting, I thought I was going to kick to death. I had to make some sort of stand to try and end this. And my original demand was an end of beatings, not just for myself, but for all prisoners in the blocks. Because it was normal, it was normal for prisoners to just get kicked around this place here. Like. And um, they made it quite clear like, that they wouldn't negotiate, that um, they would not cave in, they would not give in to any demands at all. And all that I was asking for like, was basic human rights, not to be assaulted. And, um, they weren't interested, like. It was sort of like, as I said, a heavy focus during 1978 in the media on the hunger strike that I was on, my age, and uh, what I was going through in, in the jails here. Like. So when the hunger strike ended, the screws that wouldn't go near me at all, and I had detected that sense that um, they were mostly told from a sort of high quarters, leave this guy alone, like, don't be hitting him again, don't be assaulting him, blah, 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 because they, Prior to that, like, it was a weekly occurrence, you know, 
And sometimes, you know, you'll get maybe two or three kickings in the one week. Sometimes maybe a couple of weeks will run by and you will get, will get touched. But it was a fairly regular and fairly consistent. But after Hunger Strike was on, like it all ended. And I don't think I got an hour hiding until, I think it was the winter of 1980, and it was in this block here, like. And I described the, the kick and I got earlier on, like. And it was a few hours as well, but it wasn't sort of serious, like a few slaps about the head, stuff like that. So that was okay, like, you know, um, during that particular period, yeah, there was tur turmoil in the Hicks blocks, it was like. From a prisoner's point of view, like you know, your whole focus was on the enemy, screws, just a total enemy, like so they were like. And um, I can remember dreaming at night time, this is actually waking up in the middle of dreams, that I was killing screws, I was killing Brits, and I came in waking up and wanting to get back into the dream again, like, and couldn't get under it again, and uh, <laughs> really enjoyed it, so I did like. Um, so, I was been a person who had been very young and I was full of bitterness and hatred and I seen the hate blocks as a microcosm of the state itself and I could not wait to get outside to get tore back into them again through bombs, bullets, whatever it may be like. So I was released in 1983 after serving slightly over eight years in total out of a 12 year sentence and I immediately joined the INLA again when I was released. And in fact, I was involved in operations in the very first week I was out of prison there. So I came back in again for a bombing offence. It was a no-warrant bomb in Stepan, like, um, was against a pub, which was known as Jack's Bar. And um, it was known to be frequented by the security forces, particularly RUC. And the pub itself, you it had like a security door, which is highly um, unusual for like of Stepan, like, but a security door on, and if you went to the pub, like, you were checked out, blah, 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 because the security forces used it. Now, prior to that, like, the NLA had given out a warning to different establishments, I think it was a general warning, like, that they were open to attack. And what you had, sort of, prior to the bombing I was in for, like, was a drop and well in um, Ballykelly, where the NLA bombed it, and I don't know many people were killed, 17, I think. So it was just a part of a strategy for the NLA at that time, like, to be involved in the war on bombings, and mine was putting on with that strategy. So it was me that actually planted the bomb, no warning, pub was completely demolished. Um, so many security forces on it, like my sort of UDR, RUC, and or civilians as well. Some of them were badly injured, and um, though nobody died, which was a total, complete miracle. And uh, so I found myself back in jail again. Now, the prison had totally changed. When I was in 83, I spent 18 months in criminal jail and remand and came down here. And I wouldn't say the prisoners had full control at that particular time, but they were definitely gearing towards that objective. Things had changed a lot in relation to attitudes from screws, stuff like that. Wasn't touched, wasn't harmed, wasn't even threatened by screws, which was in complete contrast to my period in prison before that. And, um, you know, I sort of spoke briefly like, about how bitter I was before getting out. Couldn't wait to get under the Brits again as soon as I got out of prison. And because of what happened to me personally, what I've seen happen to our prisoners, and plus to what the hunger strikers went through, like, and I felt that it was an honour to get, be involved, re to re-engage in their struggle again. And, even though now I like, a view that Republicans have lost the war, I um, have no regrets about what happened.
I do know like when we were first joined, the IRA, like as, as a 13 year old. I would have joined the FINA, then I would have joined the Provisional IRA Army, Army and then I would have joined the NLA in 1975. No regrets whatsoever then. I do regret that we lost the war. I do regret there was so much loss of life, really for nothing. Then. But I think it was the right thing to do at that time though, because once you're engaged in any type of struggle, like you don't know what the outcome is. It's not preordained or predetermined. So, uh, <coughs> So this is like a hate box that completely changed and there was a constant sort of battle with the screws from 1985, that's when I came back down the blocks again after I'm on Cromer Road uh, for better conditions, um, breaking the screws down, basically geared towards running the blocks ourselves. And uh, what we had sort of at the end up was political status and everything but name only. And it would be fair to say that the hunger strikers didn't die in vain. The hunger strikers did achieve or did kick off the road to political status, full political status again. Right? But in the Senate, in the overall context of the struggle itself, it was a, a, a waste of life. Because I think Republicans settled for a lot less than they deserved and fought for. And you see this, these cells are pretty small. And these, normally there's two, 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 two in each cell. Like even though that in the latter years I would have spent a lot of time just on my own, like in, in the cells. Like. And uh, it sort of struck me, you know, it's, you know we've been locked, you know, see during the blanket period, like we've been locked up 24 hours a day. Uh, no communication, no, no sort of physical contact. We did manage to sort of pass things up, up and down to each other, like smokes through the, the pipes here, put a paper through the pipe, tobacco in it, and also puts a string out of a blanket, we put a stretch and seal, you'd have made a parachute out of it, you'd have put it out the window, the breeze would have caught it, the guy next door to you would have been doing the exact same thing, so the two parachutes would have tangled, and you'd have really passed up on the next cell. And that would have happened all the way up. And also from the bottom of the doors here, you really can't see now, like, but because we saw a small gap of the doors. And they pass them the, from here to there, like, and you completely locked up. You know what we done, like, it was a small button, you would have flicked it across, and somebody would have caught it eventually. Maybe, like, maybe 20 or 30 times. And what you call was pass a lane across. So communications would have passed that way, written communications, and um, likes of tobacco. And, uh, sort of photocopies of newspapers and stuff like that. Like. So it was actually amazing so, so what the boys were able to come up with like um, while you're while you're incarcerated. Like. And the, you know what I find sort of strange and funny you know, was a lot of sort of immediate focus on the likes of for example the bully rate inquiry like you know how did the guns get in the gun cash? And to be frank you could have got AKs in here to very very easily like um, I think he had actually one case of a loyalist who smuggled budgies in, who had smuggled his pet dog in. So guns would have been no problem at all getting in. I remember guns getting smuggled out of cages, I mean guns getting smuggled into Crummer Road Jail. Explosives, cameras, wire cutters, no problem at all. Well, not to say no problem, like, but there's ways and means around it. Like. Uh, even 1983, had five guns were smuggled on. Very, very easily, like. And quite easily had as well, like, because I, I do remember guns being hidden in Crummer Road Jail for a period of years without them being discovered, like. I can remember explosives being brought on, never caught. I don't know exactly how long I spent in jail, like I never actually count up the weeks and months and stuff like that, like, but 
would be in something like 18 years, and maybe in three months, four weeks, or whatever, I just don't know. Like, I just always put it down to 18 years, like, with a break of six months in between that. So, when I got out in 1993, which is December, like, I was just turned 35. I'd spent more years in prison than I had to on the outside, like. And um, it took me away to adjust, maybe two or three years in total, like. But I had very sort of strong family connections, like I had five brothers, five sisters, like. I've been the eldest. At some stage, or and two, uh, two other brothers were actually were all in the same wing at one time. At one time, like, but them two would have done ten years each out of twenty years. I'm getting a few hidings on, on here, and over there, <laughs> and all around here. <laughs> You've, you've got the sort of the, the, the controversy which surrounded Richard Raw's claims. During Hunger Strike, like he was a PRO and he was in a unique position to know exactly what was going on in relation to negotiations between the Brits and the Republicans on the Hunger Strike. Basically, he claimed there was a deal and, um, before Joe MacDonald died which was acceptable Republican leadership in the jail. The Republican leadership actually accepted the deal. And they got a calm, allegedly from Adams, basically scuppering the deal. And I think Richard sort of alluded to the fact that the leadership of the Republican movement wanted more hunger strikers today because of the impact of the Bobby Sands election as an MP, and then what we had then was obviously one Karen getting elected. Now, if, during that controversy of Richard Ross claims, he'd done an interview with a guy called Andy McIntyre, who runs a website ironically called The Blanket. And some of our people examined that interview, myself included. And what stuck out in that interview, well, a number of things stuck out like, but what stuck out like was who, who was in control of the hunger strike? Was it the prisoners or was it the leadership of the IRA and outside? point that was made during an interview like, was that there was evidence to back up Richard Raw's claims which would be given to selected journalists and academics when the time came. Our leadership came under a bit of pressure to examine this here uh, to investigate it and as one of the people who was involved in it and I got in contact with Richard Raw and Andy McIntyre in relation to this evidence. What was it? So there was a bit of to and fro between ourselves and these other parties who had this evidence. And what I can say, it was highly alarming, it was disturbing. I dead believe Richard Raw's claims, I do indeed. Um, I have absolutely no doubt about it, that what he's speaking was the truth, that Adams could have called an end to the hunger strike before Joe MacDonald died. 
hence saving 600 Shaggers' lives, that there was a deal there that was accepted by the jail staff and then it was overturned by outside. So I'd love to see all that coming out because um, I think that we need to examine the past. We need to know everything that went on in the past, warts and all, to give future generations a true account of really what happened. Like, I don't think we'll ever get it. Like, um, because obviously what we, you know, there's a lot of sort of focus being put on truth recoveries, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the Brits will never take part in that, never, because they've got big questions to answer. Like they've been involved in a dirty game right from the very start. Um, they've been involved in all sorts of kilns, they've armed loyalists, blah, blah, blah. Like we, we know all the works like. So the evidence that was given, um, which I can't talk about at this moment in time, um, was probably damning to me. Like, and if people want to go back and read, read Richard Ross books, He's not, he's not telling lies. And again, Adams himself, I don't know what his objective was in relation to, to scuppering that deal. People can only surmise and guess that he's the man who can answer the questions. Like.